everybody, and welcome to the 11th uh, Public Occasion Agency event. Um, first, I would like to ask you to switch your mobile phones off. Um, before I introduce the speaker of this evening, uh, I'd just like to briefly say something about the POA. Um, the POA has been established by Scrap Marshall and myself, two students uh, in diploma school. Uh, and it's a self-determining public program at the AA. Um, we are set up as an agency, um, so that's basically a practice that serves other practices. And we do so by staging, staging cultural and intellectual transactions in the form of events. So as part of our institutional enterprise, each event is accompanied by a preview document, a kind of flyer announcing the event, and a review for which we commission um, an individual to, um, to basically write a text about the event. These together form the ongoing archive of the POA, this book, LUT, available from the bookshop. Um, this term, we have three other events. Um, last Tuesday, we had Nur Puripurini, who gave a very revealing talk about the role of commodities in the making of the city. Next Thursday, um, the graphic design designers Meta Haven will talk about their work and specifically about their new book, Uncorporate Identity. And on the 30th of November, we will host Arnold Reindorp, a Dutch sociologist um, who, will who will explore the city uh, as a performance. And tonight, we are very happy to introduce to you Kai van Hasselt. Kai is the founder of Chinza Kai Analyzes, a research-based advisory boutique in Amsterdam. Uh, the practice is situated at the crossroads between art, uh, economics, and urbanism. Clients ranging, ranging from architecture firms to real estate developers, cultural institutions, and governments are provided with cultural intelligence and urban strategies. Kai studied economics at the University of Amsterdam and worked for a leading Dutch trend analyst from 2000 to 2003. And later, in 2006, he worked for OMA's think tank, AMO. In his lecture, Kai will, explore, will employ the concept of reflexive urbanism to analyze the theory and practice of dealing with externalities in the city. Um, now, please join me in wel welcoming Kai van Hasselt to the AA. Good evening, everyone. Um, Many thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to come and speak here. Um, thank you for, for showing up all. Um, is my sound well? Yeah. Do I have a go? Yeah. OK. Um, yes, I'm um, going to uh, talk tonight about a topic that is very dear to me, and namely externalities. And I think that it is a topic that should be dear to you as, as an other audience of, uh, of among them uh, architects and other uh, professionals that, that work and engage with the city. Um, I'll, um, I'll go ahead. See, I'm going to talk about these things. Uh, I'll start with reflexive urbanism, explain uh, what I think that is, and then I go over to externalities, talk a bit about a research project on which I'm involved with, the Seattle project. From there we go into 10 urban finance instrument, that's sort of the, the practical part, and from there we move towards the future. How can you envision a kind of externalities exchange? Uh, briefly, very briefly on my company, Shinsekai Analysis. Um, we provide two things, cultural intelligence and urban strategies. But Jan very uh, well described uh, that, and uh, if you're very interested, you could go to my blog slash uh, site. Um, then... Uh, was that you or...? Well, then over to... Um, This is on. This is on. Yes. 
And um, now over to reflexivity. Um, there's a book which came out in 1994, which was called Reflexive Modernization. And it was written by Anthony Giddens, Scott Lash, and Ulrich Beck. Um, and the three men wrote this wonderful book, which didn't get so much attention, but they framed modernization and, and the, the current state of modernity, not so much as a post-modernity, but more as a second or a late modernity. And this particular kind of modernity, they said, well, it's a reflexive modernity. And it's reflexive in the sense that it's modernizing the modern. So it's sort of, if you could say, modernity started somewhere in Europe uh, together with the process of industrialization in the 19th century. And all those countries that were already modern were then for a second time modernized again. So it's modernizing the modern. And and then um, uh, over in Los Angeles, Michael Storper, a geographer, he, he took that book as a, as a starting point and he, he thought what could that mean for cities and for a kind of economic reality and, and he wrote a, a nice essay the, as this about the city as the center for economic reflexivity. And in it he, he said, we have arrived in a time where we reflexively shape our built environment. We no longer take our surroundings for granted, but instead seek to actively manage and develop whole areas. And if you just look around and think of the, the, the city or the country that you come from, that you see it's, it's not only about building one house or one office building, but it's, it's actually what, what developers want to do is to, to change the whole, almost the whole paradigm of a particular neighborhood or, or a street. If you think of, for example, uh, Roppongi Hills in, in Tokyo, Japan, it took the developer 17 years to build, buy out all the 700 leaseholders, uh, and then he turned it to a, maybe you co can call it a giant shopping center, but you can also call it a great addition uh, to the city. It depends a little bit where you stand on the left to right uh, uh, scale. Um, but this uh, changing of whole areas is something that, that has my uh, particular in, um, uh, interest. And um, why do I think that cities are so important f uh, if you look at the, the grander scale of this reflexive modernization? Because cities are precisely sort of the, the, the places where this process of urbanization and industrialization have taken, uh, uh, have taken place uh, during modernity. And now it's a city that's getting modernized again. Somebody else who uses the word reflexivity and reflexive is the hedge fund manager and financier and philanthropist George Soros. And he uses the word reflexivity to describe the way that both in, in history and in financial markets that uh, bubbles uh, develop and how expectations um, impact our uh, sort of our present day reality and he uses both the fall of the Soviet Union as in an example of reflexivity, but also if you look at uh, the past financial crisis, he was there in Senate uh, testifying and then he, he uses his own theory and he say, well, I, I told you so, this is how, it, how it's gonna be. And, um, but that idea of reflexivity is actually, they're really closely aligned and it's interesting uh, because the stakes, the financial stakes in the city are also are so big that in a way uh, it, it's not strange to think of the things that happen in financial markets. And also if you look at the way that different boroughs in London have, have changed and gentrified over the past uh, decades, that you see how quick uh, rem uh, things can go. I remember that in 2001 I was for the first time in Hoxton Square and I had this feeling of, oh my God, it's happening here. Um, and now, 10 years later, still a lot of stuff happening there, but rental prices, land values have gone up tremendously. But it's already the expectation, uh, and you could feel that very clearly in 2001, the expectation in a certain neighborhood that something will happen makes already goes that the prices will go up. And this process, that's what, what you can also uh, try to theorize with this reflexivity. Well, from Michael Storper on, um, I tried to, to look a little bit more deeper into how this reflexivity and this reflexive modernization is changing cities. And I, I wrote a paper which I called refle uh, in which I theorize something which I call reflexive urbanism. And it's very much about the strategic and reflexive shaping of the built environment. And it's about two levels here. It's the object level and it's the, the neighborhood around it. And 
um, if you change one of the levels, it will influence the other levels. And there, the concept of externalities um, plays a, a big role. Namely, and I, I use this, let's say you, you develop a, a wonderful new museum in a certain neighborhood. I would say that's working on the object level. But because you do that on the, on the let's say, the built environment, the area around it, the neighborhood, that changes that because you put a museum somewhere or because, let's say, there's the Colombia flower market, which is very successful, attracts a lot of people, uh, and that has greatly influences the expectations of people of a certain neighborhood. And this, this, this game, which it is almost, that's what I try to, to describe with this reflexive urbanism. And you see that the, the really smart developers, and I think also the really uh, smart architects that really strategically think about how the cities are sh being shaped, they, they focus on this. But I would also say they will not use these words probably. They will use other words. But everybody is aware that it's good to have certain um, very important functions, institutions in your city. That's also why the competition for such institutions, but also for events like the Olympics is so big. Because these Olympics too, an event too, can make sort of create these reflexive urbanism processes. Um, and then with the ex again, you get the whole game with the expectations of the Olympics. Site become um, more attractive. P investors go into it. Uh, it also brings, uh, it creates this process of, of uh, regeneration, but also gentrification. So it's not only good what happens, but it's powerful what happens, and it, and therefore it should be analyzed well. Um, some examples of places where where you see that an object and a neighborhood are being transformed. This is Battery Park City in, in New York. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, filled with um, uh, the, the land that they basically dug out from uh, for where they, they built the World Trade Center. And uh, over the years, it has developed into a very high end, but a fairly nice, attractive um, residential area. And what they did, what you see over here, is a small park, and they built it in the middle between all these big buildings. And they wanted to create a park, and the park is so successful that there are stories of uh, mothers with young children that take the train 45 minutes from New Jersey to let their children play here because there's no, they say there's no nice area in New Jersey where they can have a sort of safe, pleasant environment. The other thing was that all these people want a green space to look upon. But the buildings are actually so high that the, the natural, uh, there was not enough natural daylight. So they put up uh, big mirrors on top of these buildings. And these mirrors, they turn with the sun to make sure that the grass gets its eight hours of light every day. So they're really thinking strategically, highly techno technological about how to make it a nice space. Another example of a, a very top-down but, but transformative project is uh, the f a former um, uh, highway that was in, in the middle of downtown Seoul. And two years ago, um, he, he took the decision uh, to take that uh, road out and to restore the uh, original stream of water that was there. And uh, it, he created a four mile long green blue pathway through the, the city center. Um, there are no, oh, there are no there's no advertisement there, and in Seoul there's not much of there are no there's not really a tradition of parks. So I think it was a, a good and a, a thing that he did. But it also, I mean, it's if you see if you think this is the object, it greatly transformed the areas around it. I would say it has a lot of positive externalities. The land values around it has have gone up. Another example of of reflexive urbanism, but a more bottom up approach, is what you see in the way that uh, all over the world Chinatowns are, f are, are forming. Um, uh, in a way, it's a, it's a more powerful network than the network that you used to have of all the World Trade Centers that you have all over the world. And now, actually, this network of Chinatowns is it's probably the, the stronger, more important network of, of, of hotspots in the cities. And these Chinatowns, they're, they're, change, they're, they're growing. Look at, if you think of the, the New York Chinatown, and I'm not so much familiar with this Chinatown, but the New York Chinatown has taken over, for example, Little Italy and all other of these um, um, 
yes, places, and it grows and it grows and it changes, um, it, yeah, it brings in this reflexivity, changes the areas around it. Then an example from Johannesburg in South Africa, where in the middle of downtown uh, Johannesburg, where uh, after 1994, there are not a not a lot of white people that actually come to downtown Johannesburg. Um, uh, a developer and his son, they asked William Kentridge, the, the very famous South African artist, to build his studio sort of there. Then they put in some galleries here, uh, a music space there, a good restaurant, and this uh, little uh, courtyard. And they, they developed that area uh, in the middle of the, the downtown area. And it, it has really become a hotspot for, for, the, for the arts, for the creative industries, fashion. And um, now you, you would never have people that would live downtown Joburg. And uh, now they're actually around this, it became a starting point for a whole area that's being redeveloped. You can definitely criticize it for it being elitist. Um, and, it's, and, and they are well aware of how they can be more inclusive. But it's definitely a start, and it's, I think, what it has done on a general scale is more positive than negative. Um, and, uh, and it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a successful place. But you can also think of something like the, the, the city farm in Hackney, um, which is uh, totally not pretentious, uh, but is really good if you have children or if you're just interested yourself in animals and you want to see how Bella is doing, um, then you can. Uh, uh, and you can go there and, and check it out. And in, I mean, this is a, a very non, it's, it's, this is only very interesting for people with a particular focus, but uh, in such ways, I remember reading an article about uh, the Japanese uh, school somewhere in London and all the Japanese parents, they could t pay twice the house prices uh, of the, the, the British people that would live in that particular area because they wanted to be close to the school. So you could also think, um, why not have the developer or the community invest in the school and then sort of the externalities that come from, from that, you pull them together and you, you create these areas. Um, I'll, 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 I'll show and I'll explain more of the thinking uh, in detail um, later on. Um, from, from the city farm I go to urban agriculture, uh, which is a great instrument to achieve these positive externalities. And this thing is interesting because it can both be used in, in growing s areas, in growing cities, where you have vacant space, which will get another function in a couple of years, so as temporary fill-in. But you can also use it, and that's maybe even more important, in cities that are declining. Uh, I'm thinking of the cities in the US, in the Midwest, um, and then actually, what do you do when, when the houses sort of, when, when there are not enough people to fill the city, and then actually urban agriculture makes sense. Um, and it, again, creates these externalities, positive ones. Um, I, I want to look in particular at the example of the Boston Commons. The, these commons, sort of common land, uh, one of the oldest commons uh, from the US from 16, uh, 1634. Um, this is a, an image from the First World War where they were again doing urban agriculture there and this is how it looks now. And the commons became as a, as a concept very famous because of an article that Garrett Hardin published in 1968 and that article was called The Tragedy of the Commons. And in the article he analyzed how sort of in a traditional way there, there seemed to be a kind of balance between how um, uh, herders had their cattle on one common piece of land, on the commons. And um, as sort of industri industrialization took place, uh, but also as more and more people uh, gathered into the city, there was actually a sort of a, this tragedy of the commons, how he describes it, that if one person puts another, let's say, puts another cow on the commons, uh, he would gain the sort of the, the benefits of that, sort of the extra milk, but as more and more of these cows uh, came on the, the same piece of land, on the commons, the, the, the negative externalities, the sort of the, uh, that there were too many, there, there was a too, too many cows, that was shared by everyone. So there was a great disincentive and disalignment for that one person to put your extra cow there, but for the community to, to share or to suffer the, the negative consequences of that. 
And before that, there was already um, the famous Chief Seattle, uh, a tribal uh, Indian tribal leader in the U.S., who, uh, who famously said, uh, but how can you buy or sell the sky, the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? And this is a 1970s movie text of somebody who thought that he would probably uh, have said that. So this is not really accurate. Um, but it's the closest what I could find uh, of him. Um, and now, last year, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize for her groundbreaking work on what is sort of how you have to manage this problem of the commons, not just as a theoretical piece, because Garrett's Hardin piece was very much on a theoretical level, but also a lot on in practice. So how do we deal with biodiversity? How do we deal with our forests, with our oceans, with overfishing? And she analyzed how um, the, the role that prop property rights and in, in effect the institutional order, sort of the laws the we have in place, that they play such a a uh, huge part in, in providing the right governance of these common pool resources. So, um, and it was really good, I think, that somebody in economics won the Nobel Prize and that there was this acknowledgement that you have to put all the economic thinking not just in uh, sort of uh, what price should be an option, should an option be, but also in how do we deal with the common uh, pool resources with our, with our common goods. Two other names, if you're if you're after this lecture really interested in externalities, is uh, Pigou, who, who did all the traditional thinking on externalities and economics, and then from the 60s, Ronald Coase changed all that thinking because he said there's a reciprocal nature of external externalities, and what you could what what that means, I, th I think it, it deserves an example, and that is, for example, you have a um, a nice restaurant and a, maybe a big industrial. Um, yeah, uh, well, some industrial site very close to each other, and the industrial site produces pollution, and the little restaurant, which is nearby, suffers from that. And traditionally, I think Pigou would say, well, the industrial site has to, the fabric, or the, not the fabric, but the, the industrial site has to move. They cause the externalities. But Coase said, no, it's actually reciprocal. It's, you need two parties to tango, and two parties to have these, to have these, that you can speak of these externalities. So maybe the restaurant has to move, but has to deal with the site, has maybe to offer the restaurant money or something else, or offer them an alternative site. But uh, it's not per se the polluter that has to go, but you have to make sure that the polluter and those that are affected by that find a, a just manner to deal with it. So that's close uh, addition to the to theory. Now we come to... Uh, the Seattle project that I'm involved with. Um, I founded it two years ago with uh, Peter Robinet of the US who now lives in Amsterdam. And we analyze all these externalities. We particularly look at externalities and how they work out in the built environment. So um, we don't really look at biodiversity and sustainability, but it's, it's I mean, externalities is, is big in, in that realm. But we particularly look, how is it shaping the cities? How, is it, how could it potentially shape buildings? Uh, how would it affect the work of an architect or a developer? We focus on three things, of course externalities, but also collective action. Um, how do you get things done together? Very often you have the problem of, of free riders that um, everybody knows that it's better to work together, but if you also know that if you're going to pay for something but your neighbor is probably not going to pay for it, you have less of an incentive for it to for it to pay, and, and this as a whole, there's a problem that it will probably not happen. Um, that's, for example, why the army is being, t uh, that we as a country pay collectively for our army, um, because otherwise, if you would do it on an individual level, everybody would say, well, I don't, I d I'm not in a hurry to go to war, so why should I pay for the army? Um, another thing which is very important to get externalities and collective action right is to focus on incentives. So. What should I offer you um, so that you go along within this uh, collective action? And there, if you look at incentives, it's very important to, uh, because their incentives are very powerful. Think of the financial crisis. There has been a lot of attention to all these banks that gave incentives, aka bonuses, to their bankers. So, and you have to, it's okay to give bonuses, but you have to be very precise for what you give them. For example, if you give them only bonuses if they earn a lot of money, they sort of 
they take a lot of risk, they get the upside, but they don't share in the downside. So that kind of thinking is what I describe with incentives. Well, this is my only mathematical slide, but this shows uh, here in the middle, this is sort of the market equilibrium. This is the demand curve of any good, and this is the supply curve. But if you now take in the E is for externalities, this is the, the sort of the externalities that a certain good also, let's say, pollution. That, uh, but and if you take this pollution, uh, if you take that into account, you get into this curve, and then you see that the demand curve sort of hits the supply curve somewhere else, and there's, let's say, in it's always in economics about where demand meets supply, so in this case, there will be only so much being sold of a certain good against this higher price instead of this market equilibrium without the externalities. So mathematically, it's, it's all about this, and, but how do you get this right in the best way, in the least, uh, in the way that, uh, that, that's most optimal to society? Now, um, 10 urban finance instruments, I'll, I'll go through them, uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll also describe them with some examples. Um, we're comparing 10 for the Seattle project, so that's why you, you get this list. The first is business improvement districts. It's something very deeply rooted in Anglo-Saxon capitalist uh, sort of market liberal culture. Uh, it's founded in the US and Canada, but also I think quite a lot now in the UK and even in the Netherlands they're now starting to experiment with this. And the whole idea is that you have, it's, it's all about the collective ac action. So for example, in Chinatown, uh, here in, in London, which is, um, you have a, a legal mechanism to raise funds. So everybody, everybody that has a piece of real estate there or uh, as a shop has to pay an extra tax, but it doesn't go to a government, it goes to the BID. And the BID organizes all kind of collective activities or cleaning or security or services or marketing for this area. And the idea is that because you have a, a business improvement district, uh, that they make marketing for it, that more people come to the area, and that that pays back the investment that everybody did. A good example is also Bryant Park in New York City, which was very run down. They also started a business improvement district, um, and that invested in a lot of activities there. So in the winter, there's an ice rink. In the summer, there are fashion shows. There's even an, an outdoor reading room of the library. And the, the BID takes care of all these activities. But you also have something which is called tax incremental financing. And what that is, is that a city, uh, in a, let's say there's a rundown neighborhood, and the city says, we don't have money to, to invest in, in, the, in all the, the, the public uh, infrastructure that needs to be there, but we, we make a bond um, of all the income, the, the tax income that we expect to, to get there over, let's say, 10 or 20 years. And then they, so you take 20 years of tax revenue on a specific place, you make a bond of that, and with that money, you, the, the city invests in that area, but it also promises developers that they will not raise the tax during that period. So developers actually have an incentive to invest there because what if they also privately invest in, let's say, a new building, uh, the value that goes up, they sort of they don't have to pay the extra tax for the fact that they made it nicer there. Um, so that's nice to private property owners, but in a, it's bad for the city because in a way it gives away all the upside of, uh, of a certain development in an area. So this is a tricky one. And thirdly is uh, something called land banks. And a land bank is when you get uh, a lot of private or public and private um, or, uh, or organizations, developers that uh, collectively buy up land in a specific area and they all put it together in a land bank. And that's a way actually of, of making sure that you can operate better uh, collectively, collectively you can also say that there's less competition because there's one entity that buys up all the pieces in an area. But for some things, it's, it's very uh, effective. Some examples, well, I, I talked about um, Bryant Park. Let's, let's do another three and then some, uh, some more examples. Uh, a community development corporation is again something from the US and a good example is this. This is Project Row House in, in Houston and it's founded by an artist, Rick Lowe, who you see, see here. And what he did was that in a really rundown uh, black neighborhood in, uh, in Houston, the third ward, 
he, with a group of artists, they um, helped to fix up all these old uh, row houses and they turned them into exhibition spaces. And through that process, which started in the mid 90s, uh, this part of town became, uh, it, it was really, really run down. It became much more attractive. It actually became so attractive that at one point there were a lot of developers, in this case it would be white developers, that would, let's say, uh, and the population there here was, was very poor. So they would come up to, let's say, a grandmother and say, hey grandma, here's 60K, we buy the house, put her out of the house, and then they would uh, raise the house and build a new condominium um, there. And this process was actually very tough because they invest, the artists uh, invested to make this neighborhood nicer, but actually the, the consequence then was that it became so expensive for people that they could not live there anymore. So what they did then is they in introduced this community development corporation and they, they separated the, sort of the right to the house to live there and the land. So the land, sort of this all became collective, but the grandmother from my example would keep her own house. So she could sell the house to somebody else but she could not sell the right to develop a new house on that land. And that was a powerful instrument so that people would still be owner of their, of their asset, of their house, but also that you had a, a, a kind of collective purpose for this area. So that, that's the CDC. Then tradable development rights. I'll, I'll explain them with some examples. And, and public-private public partnerships and, and the British uh, version is the private finance initiative. And this is being used I think it was introduced under a more, I don't know if it was inter introduced under Thatcher, but it's definitely more uh, liberal market thinking. And it's, for example, being used if, uh, if a, gov a city government wants a school to be built, but they don't have money to it, and then they create a kind of public-private partnership in a way that they make a deal with a private entity to develop that school and the, and the city government over the years pay for it, but it's developer that, that takes upon the risk of delivering that school. But the, the FAR bonus and the TDRs are, are some of the most interesting of these externalities and these urban finance instruments, these ways of, of achieving positive externalities in the city. And this is an example of, of an FAR bonus. And, um, for example, in New York, but also in other uh, cities where they have not an absolute height to what level you can build in the city, but more a relative height, they, they use this, this system of FAR bonus. So, for example, if you have this plot and the FAR bonus is, or the FAR uh, uh, that you're allowed to build is, is 100%, you have the choice that either you build uh, one level on the whole floor or you build, let's say, this all, turn it into a park and then you put the three, uh, sort of the 75% of the land that you don't use, you can uh, go up into the air. And then, for example, what they do in, in Japan is that if the government wants you to, for example, this is a residential area, but they want office also there, or uh, retail, they say, well, if you, if you also put a, a store in on the ground floor, you, can, uh, you get an extra floor, so you get an FAR bonus. So this is a way that you create a very dynamic land market and the government can give incentives to private developers, private investors, to develop the city in, in that manner that, that government seems best um, without actually having to spend money on it. And here, if you then look at the, uh, these maps, these are maps of New York City in different areas where you show how high it, uh, what FAR you are allowed to build. And here you see very clearly that around the transit hub, uh, you, you, the, the, the deepest red is the highest level. So you can build very high, make a very high, high FAR if, you, if you're closely to the station. And that kind of thinking is, I think, is now mainstream because everybody is realizing how important it is to be close to, to public transportation. Um, uh, another way uh, of these trans-tradable development rights is, is if you think, for example, of an air right. Let's say you have a, um, here, that you have, you are the British Museum and you have a lot of space above you and technically you could build there, but practically you're not going to build above the British Museum. So you could, with these tradable development or tradable air rights, you could uh, sell your air rights above your museum, maybe to the developer next door, and he could, could then use that space and build, build a higher building. 
So it's again the same principle as the FAR, uh, but you get a very dynamic, different um, yeah, way in which the city develops. Um, the High Line in New York, very successfully, uh, was built with a very um, smart system of exchanging all these kind of rights. There were hundreds of people who had um, land or, or buildings that were uh, uh, located along the High Line, and they exchanged all these land rights so that the High Line could actually be developed in, in, in the way it has now. Um, and this is a from a PhD of a Dutch uh, lawyer, and she looks at, well, industrial estates, not very sexy, but actually crucially to get it right, because in the Netherlands there are far too many industrial estates, so all these places with light industrial areas. Every municipality wanted one, and now they're all derelict, they look bad, but actually they're so bad that it's cheaper often to build a new one in another municipality than to fix the existing one up. So you have enormous sort of negative uh, market outcome. That was the free market. Every could, everybody could build one. And what she analyzed is that you, can, you have to do something about it, but you can sort of intervene within the existing uh, institutional order or you can restructure the existing institutional order. And as I said earlier about uh, what um, the Nobel Prize winner did, she did all the research about how important laws are in, in getting this right. She looked at that very often if you change, restructure the institutional order, you get to actually price these externalities. But within the, ex the existing order, it's not, it's not possible to do this externalities pricing. So you really have to rethink the system. And then uh, you can get things a lot better if you, if you price in the externalities of, for example, not uh, or leaving uh, one of these industrial estates. Then uh, value capture finance and special government entities. In value capture finance, I like to um, look at, take two examples uh, uh, um, to, to explain it. Value capture finance is when you, as a, let's say as the city government, you invest in, for example, the extension of the Jubilee Line, costs really a lot of money, costs billions of pounds, but actually all along those new stops, the land increased also billions of pounds. But the problem was, in this case for the UK government, that they had to put in the investment for the Jubilee Line, yet the private, and because in, in most cases it was private property owners and investors that had the land rights, they got all the upside, but the government did have to, had to do all the work. And value capture finance is a way of capturing some of the value that they create. So in this case, it would be the, you would say like, okay, we want to build a, a subway line here or a metro stop, but um, we're going to share, uh, we're going to sort of, we do the investments, but we want to, uh, to tax to take a part of the upside that we create. So it's actually a, a way of sharing the cost, but also of the upside between the public and the private. And I think this is an important thing. And another, and I'll show you why it's important. This is an article from September from a, a, a blog in New York, Market Urbanism. And he refers to an article from the Wall Street Journal that says that uh, the New York uh, uh, Transit Authority, the MTA, they wanted, they had a plan to build all new bus lines up to the sort of, to the Bronx and Queens and uh, sort of the, the further areas of, of New York City. And actually the MTA didn't have money, so they canceled the project. And now the Wall Street Journal found out that there were a lot of uh, flats, apartments, close to those proposed uh, metro sort of uh, bus stops that lost really a lot of money in, in value. The value dropped by as much as 20%. And in the existing system, um, so th there's no way that, that the MTA takes into consideration the, the loss that is on the hand of the, 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 the people that own those properties. But actually, if you could share if those people that had the properties, if they would co-invest in that bus line, it would be much, much better, both for the people that had the flats and good access to into the city, but also a way for the MTA to, to build that subway line. And I think that if you look now to the present situation where you have a conservative government, which is really um, slashing a lot of services, uh, not just in the UK, but same thing in, uh, in unfortunately, a lot of uh, European cities, uh, continental European cities too, that government says, yes, we don't have the money, that's perfectly true, but actually, if you take in consider considerations all these externalities 
that such a public transportation uh, service uh, calls, if you, if you take them into the calculation, you come to a different conclusion. Actually, you should have built that, that metro line or that um, bus line. Another uh, way uh, of this value capture finance is a, a rural example. There's something in the Netherlands called the landscape auction, and that's where um, very touristic areas uh, near Nijmegen, um, the farmers are actually the persons that have the land, and there are thousands of tourists that, that go there uh, every weekend to bike there because it's so beautiful. But who get the upside of all those tourists? Those are the restaurants and the hotels, but not the farmers who make the land beautiful. So what did they do with this landscape auction? They auctioned all the, for 10 years, sort of the maintenance costs of, the, of keeping that land beautiful, and they auctioned it off among the local community, among the stakeholders. And in a way, because they got the externalities of it, the tourists, they also uh, pay now for the maintenance of that land. So this is another way of, of sharing the costs and the benefits. Um, last two examples, usage pricing and, uh, and microfinance. Uh, usage pricing is, is uh, among others, you see it uh, in, the, in Singapore, you have this system of electronic road pricing. And if you go, depending on the time, uh, if you go along this road, you have to pay a certain fee. Well, in London, you also have congestion charging. Congest congestion charging. I think in London, it doesn't really doesn't matter if you go there early in the day or it's just a lot of money every time you you pass. But in Singapore, they actually have a, s a system that decides sort of now if this is the only car on the road, probably pays nothing or or very little. But if there are hundreds of others around you you pay a lot and that's exactly to price in this principle of the externalities of you being on the road here now are low but they're very high if there are 100 cars in the uh, all there together so this usage pricing if you do it well you give an incentive to people to use the road when they cause the least problems to others and then the microfinance examples um, which I think are very interesting, especially for, for newly urbanizing areas and to uh, countries in the global south, um, that you have, for example, now is um, um, an organization in Kenya that sells rain insurance. So farmers can take, they can buy, kind of, and this is a micro insurance, so it's very little value, but they insure themselves against the cost that there's too little or too much rain. But you also have another example where of microfinance where they financed uh, for people to buy beehives and the beehives um, they pay the loan back with the honey that they get from the beehive but uh, the cross-pollination of an area that the bees create there those are the externalities that is shared by all so again it's a it's a micro scheme but somebody sort of there's an economic transaction transaction you borrow money to get to have that beehive you pay it back with your honey and uh, and sort of the commons the, 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 the land around it, the flowers there, they profit from all the, the bees doing the cross-pollination. So these also in, in sort of in the, not in the city, not in the sort of the liberal markets, the, the sophisticated stuff, but also in, in these new uh, countries that, that develop rapidly and urbanize, there is, I think, this, this part is very interesting there. Um, we analyzed all these 10 instruments um, and we compared them we looked what kind of incentives are actually involved here, uh, but more importantly, how also how liberal or how regulated does the uh, environment need to be for such a thing to, uh, to, to work. And at the same time, uh, if you look at all these 10, how public or how private is it actually? And here, there's not much of a correlation, but there are some things that, that, are, uh, that are remarkable if you compare them. And here you see a very strong correlation. And here we looked at how urban or how rural um, is often the uh, sort of does the work in and how much is it something which only works in the developed world versus would it also work in the developing world. And there you see the strong correlation between urban and developed and developing and rural. And lastly, also importantly, we looked how vulnerable is it to corruption because if you look to all these, uh, to the developing world, you want to make sure that they are not too vulnerable for corruption. Now let me come to the conclusions. I think the most remarkable thing is that things that require liberal regimes require government. So the things that I showed you that were, let's say, most capitalistic, most, most 
with their origins in the U.S., they and, and sort of in a way they're anti-government, but actually they can only they're so sophisticated as an externality scheme, as an urban finance instrument, that they can only exist if you have that government um, that that makes sure that creates those those laws, that institutional order again. And I think this is interesting because it's in a way it's counterintuitive that exactly the liberal regime, the things that require a liberal regime, require government, and that's sort of what you you see uh, in a way in, in this. So the very, li the very liberal ones uh, are also the, the, the most private ones. Um, on the other hand, things that occur in illiberal regimes are either the result of the government or by completely bypassing it. Um, and I don't know which, that's probably the example of, uh, of that. Um, well, what we think is interesting to, to, to further research is to how these things work out in the urban versus the rural world, developed world for developing, um, but also, well, we'd like to focus it on sub-Saharan Africa. Does it make sense? Like the, the the example with the beehives, can what kind of things work there? Um, and uh, I presented it two months ago in Nairobi at a planning conference, and I did get some feedback about that. So that was interesting. So, um, so far for the UFIs, but how can these externalities actually go mainstream? Because I, I showed the mechanism, I showed the theory, some of the theory, there's much more there. But um, uh, actually, you, you need markets. And, um, and mainstream is markets, and there are a lot of market innovations nowadays. For example, this side is a, an auction of World of Warcraft. And in a lot of these multiplayer games, you have very good working, sophisticated auctions where people are perfectly uh, well capable of placing a price, a real a monetary price value on something which is totally virtual. And maybe in such a way you could also think of, it's very difficult for each of us to think, well, what's it worth to me that I have access to a park or another positive externality or that, that factory mo moves away? Or how much should the factory pay me to move away and to find a new spot? Um, but if, you, if, there are, if there are a lot of players so it's in a game or in the city, you actually you're able to, I think, to to create these uh, externality values to put a price on it. Another example of, of of pricing expectations that we have is the the Hollywood Stock Exchange. Um, it's a well, it's somewhere between a, a game and a real stock exchange. It's in existence for over ten years now, and you can actually buy uh, uh, shares in movies, or you can buy bonds in 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 in, in uh, actors. And um, and you can trade them with each other. And actually, it's so inf it has become so influential that now the big studios they look at the Hollywood Stock Exchange because it actually what the value of these bonds gives a very good predict prediction of how successful a certain movie will be. So you can test it. You could, for example, think like if we which actors should we put together to create a very successful film. Um, and you can calculate uh, the value. And um, in the same way, Intrade is a company that, that also creates a prediction market. For example, like Sarah Palin to the Republic will to be Republican presidential nominee. Well, that's a, you have to pay 18 on the dollar, or sort of uh, 18 percent, uh, uh, 18 no, 18 cents on the dollar um, if you want to buy that uh, option or. Right, but you can also buy, and that's not so likely to happen this year apparently. The the chance of the USA and/or Israel to execute an overt air airstrike against Iran by the end of the year, uh, that's three percent. Um, so that's that's low. Um, um, and the Republican Party candidate to win is uh, even lower, luckily. But I think that it's probably a lot of Democrats that have been buying these shares to or sell them to, to make it look more negative. Um, but in this way, you can, and now I come back to, to Soros and its reflexivity and its expectations, it's a way of sort of trading those expectations, of making those expectations real. And I think those expectations of what the city will be, that you can bridge, sort of make a bridge in your mind to the, the role that externalities play in the city. Um, the, the founders of Eflux, the, uh, the art newsletter, 
uh, came up recently with something which is called Time Bank, and it's a, a platform where groups and individuals can pool and trade time and skills, bypassing money as a measure of value. Um, if this becomes very successful, this Time Bank, it will just be the new currency, uh, but it's still very good that they sort of try to monetize, and, and in the same way I was talking with the externalities, they to try to work with this collective action, and uh, but they, they 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 go at it via social capital. Um, that's the way that they uh, they play it. And here I, I show an example from the Chicago Climate Exchange because here you can actually uh, trade externalities, but you also see it has gone f totally flat. This is a negative externality that you can trade here. It's namely it's the right to pollute. It's the right to uh, to produce um, uh, carbon. And what happened here is that uh, there was always the thought it was still, it was not yet an obligation there, but there was always the thought that the US government would make it uh, obligatory to trade these carbon. And when this happened, everybody knew that it's not going to happen anymore. But it's also an example that you need a reliable government to have these functioning externalities markets. And I think that these functioning externalities markets are important because they give more an incent of an incentive, especially to do good things in the city and normally you would let's say you create a park or let's say maybe even that you you have a, a big garden a really big garden and you open it up to other people to to enter it and you in a, with these externalities you could put somehow you could pr price that but now there's almost no way to 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 with, let's say with the audience with everybody here to to put a value on that externality and that's why we're we're thinking along this line of okay, it's, it's important to get a price on it. And Chief Seattle said, who owns the land, and actually now there's a lot of people who own the land, but, we're still, but still it's important to provide these common goods. He was right in that. Um, and markets are still uh, the most effective way of allocating scarce goods. So probably go with the markets instead of sort of go around the markets, but make the markets include externalities. So maybe once you have an externalities exchange where you can uh, buy, for example, you could invest in, in, in air rights without actually owning the building. You could invest, for example, in the air above the British Museum. Uh, and you could that then trade that for instance, the air above the Frick collection. Uh, and now coming back to the commons. What is the status of the commons? Uh, I s mentioned a number of things. I think markets are still the most effective mechanism to allocate scarce resources. Uh, those um, incentives are very, very powerful. We've seen that during the crisis. But you could also use those external, uh, those incentives for good. Um, uh, first, a lot of goods or things used to be common because we couldn't actually um, measure them. They could not be monitored. In many cases, we can now, thanks to technology, and. Uh, and now, so we c we have to we can take better care of it. There, I refer back to the the work of the Nobel Prize winner on how to how you deal with the oceans, which her thinking is about biodiversity. Uh, I think we should focus uh, people in within this pr uh, pra pr sort of who practice in the city have to focus it on the built environment. You need a trustworthy government to create a framework for such markets, otherwise you get uh, this. Um, and uh, um, and at the same time, it should not only uh, uh, be the government that actually deals with these things. In the case of, for example, the Jubilee Line, all these infrastructure investments, the government doesn't have the money to do it. Um, we may not like that message, but it's for now the reality. Private actors actually do have that money, but there's a way that you have to navigate the two markets. So you have to share the in investments and then also share the upside. And I think that can lead to a more dynamic and better functioning system. And that actually maybe even more stakeholders are hurt than when government uh, holds the traditional monopoly on the allocation of externalities. And with that, I would like to conclude and um, just say what is now proven was once imagined. And I uh, uh, hope you will think about uh, the role that externalities can play in the city. Many thanks. Kai, um, thank you for this wonderfully structured uh, talk. It's uh, extremely insightful. Um, 
I think um, we immediately open it up for questions. So um, are there already questions in the audience? Yeah. yeah hi. Um, I like your um, talk about this entire um, reciprocal way in terms of developing and managing a city. So um, I guess another good example would be like in Paris, where JC the Coup sponsors the infrastructure for the cycling system in, yep. in return for all the um, advertising rights. So I was just thinking, since um, the majority of us are architecture students or architects, so what um, can we actually do beyond like simply designing the aesthetics of the building and creating the image of a new type of lifestyle where, where we see in the case of um, corporate campuses um, from Novartis to um, Amsterdam Zuidas. So um, like based on experience and uh, consulting experience with architectural firm, can we play a more active role in, in engaging these um, externalities games? Or um, are, are we just um, um, subjected to purely design? Yeah. No, I, I think uh, you, you, you can and definitely you should. Um, a very market driven example is for example in, sh is in, ex in Chicago where if you uh, sort of if your building goes up and then you leave uh, sort of the how do you how do you pronounce it if the building goes if you leave space open sort of your building goes back a little bit so that you allow for the sunlight to enter the street you can you actually get that FAR the, the FAR bonus so it's in a way but this is very practical it's about optimizing actually the, sh the sort of making different building shapes but I think much more that um, as architects they should also be uh, uh, I think they would be the most inventive uh, also architects of these kind of systems. So um, it would be very interesting to get, um, uh, how do you say that? Um, I think that, the, that if the profession of architects could also sort of put their intelligence and their research into what are actually the things that hold the greatest externalities that are, have the greatest sort of good externalities for the cities that uh, in their research of what are then the most important things that they can also play a, a large role there and that they and there's always sort of space is always a limited resource so you always need insight for thinking on how to optimize that so the, the pressures that you have when you deal with these externalities I think is much more than just aesthetics but there's a real role for architects to deal with it but it will also be together with people that think more from the financial side uh, because finance is still so much the language in, we, in which we describe these principles. Hey, um, so I was one thing is, is bringing, um, kind of identifying externalities, um, positive externalities. Another thing is modeling kind of ways of, of sharing the benefits of collecting these externalities, these positive externalities. Have you strategized about ways of kind of accessing stakeholders and bringing them to the table? Because you mentioned at the end that a stable government is obviously an important factor in that, but actually um, convincing people that it's in their interest to cooperate is a whole other issue into itself. So I was wondering if you dealt with that at all. Uh, I've, I've not, I have no experience with that, nor have I really researched it. Uh, but I imagine it, 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 it will be a, a big world and uh, there's a lot of to be gained there. Maybe you could look at the way that, that, that planners are actually so much now involved with uh, getting the community communities involved. Sort of that it's not yet, not just top-down planning anymore, but it's very much more what do you want in your neighborhood. And this, this more bottom-up approach is if you connect that to this kind of thinking, that we would be at least a better way than just the top-down planning because then the government or the, the planner has the monopoly on how to allocate these externalities and that's exactly what we, uh, what we don't want. Um, so it, sh it should be bottom-up, but how to do it, uh, I, I, have, I have not reached or, or looked into. Um, could you tell a little bit more about your clients? So who would hire you to use your body of research or the institutions or uh, my sort of th this stuff what I talk uh, spoke about today or sort of what I do in my uh, f for money I guess <laughs> I guess for money and maybe how what you talked about today is, is okay well I, I I hope that I get a cl clients that that want to do this 
Uh, I think it would be uh, developers and maybe some architects. Um, I, what I do is, uh, in, for example, in 2007, I worked with uh, Marta Schwartz, the, the US landscape architect, she and, and Foster and Architectonica, they had, um, uh, there was um, a project, a sort of a competition for a new site uh, in front of the coast of Monaco. And they were all researching, is it possible, how should it look? And then Marta Schwartz approached me and said, well, can you look at to the concept? What can we do there that would make it actually nice to live there? Um, so I looked, I called with a lot of Monachask people, uh, okay, what's interesting to you? Um, well, that it's fiscally friendly is interesting to them. Um, and uh, But also, and then there was one cre uh, uh, cr uh, crucial person, and that was namely the, the, the Agilev, uh, the, the Russian impresario of the Ballet de Russe. And for a long time, he was based in Monaco, and he was he's crucial both to understand European culture, but also he's crucial to the Russians. And the Russians are probably somebody, a group of buyers that you want in Monaco. So what I proposed was, well, there's a big collector of, uh, of the Agilev material. There's actually now a show on the Agilev in the V&A. Uh, but I proposed, well, maybe we should offer an apartment to this collector couple that they can live on that island and that they bring their collection there. And then you have, for example, the Agilev Museum. And that's exactly interesting to the Russians and to the Europeans. And there are not, not that many things that are interesting to Russians and Europeans. Um, and um, uh, that, that's one case, uh, that, that's all pre-sort uh, pre, uh, of bubble bursting. Um, now, uh, last year I went for a big retail developer. I went to Morocco to look at um, how people house the, the shop, uh, if there are shopping centers there, there are not so many, but how's the shopping culture there? How's the political climate? Uh, what should we know if we want to be successful in that uh, country? Who should we know? What should we know? Uh, where should we take into consideration? These kind of questions. So that's the research phase. And then it's um, the, the sort of the urban strategies is the advice that comes on top of that. So if this is a situation, we should, um, well, what was in Morocco, I don't have a, a clear example like the Diaghilev, but that's the, that's the kind of work that I do. Are there more questions from the room? No? Well, I, I think um, perhaps we continue the conversation with a beer in the bar. Um, I would like to thank the audience for coming, and especially a warm thank you to Kai. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>